Because <laughs> the way you, you look so involved, I thought you were talking about somebody else. <laughs> The one thing throughout the day, throughout the week, that I've been emphasized is what we said on Monday. There's a difference between a manager and a leader. And we said one of the things that is critical about a leader, because he is called leader, he goes ahead, he looks ahead, and others follow. So one critical deliverable out of a leader is visionary. You cannot be a leader unless you are visionary, because where are you leading us to? You can be manager, because managing things as they are. But if you are a leader, the emphasis is, this is where we are, but this is not where we are staying. So when a pastor who is a leader takes over a congregation, the first three months is simply to try to understand where they are, who they are, why they are, while the questions are answered, because you can't do that until you have given yourself a chance, they start asking, this is where we are. Where should we be? And if you truly are a leader, you have a better place from where they are to where they can be. One that is now very clear about the vision of that church, of that group, of that ministry into the future, then it will be very, very important that you understand it very well. And then you have to carry the people from what they are used to <laughs> to where you are taking them. The trouble is human beings resist change. So most of us, because we don't want trouble, we do not want to change. We leave people the way they are because we want peace. But then you are a manager, not a leader. If you are a leader, despite all the challenges of moving the group from where it is to where it should be, you will take the risk. And that's why this is one of the most important subjects you can deal with. As a leader, how do you move the group from where it is to where it should be? One of the things that people have, have uh, that has helped, it's not very old, but has helped is preparation of an SP, strategic plan. How many pastors have strategic plans for their church? Hands up. Pastors or anything? A, a strategic plan. We have strategic plans for our church, but I'm not a pastor. Oh, no, no, I'm only asking pastors. <laughs> yeah, pastors. Okay, so it's a very small minority. And there are three reasons why people don't prepare it. The first one, they don't even know what it is. So you can't ask somebody to have a, a strategic plan and he doesn't even know what it is because it's not taught in Bible school. Am I right? So how is anybody going to have a strategic plan when it is not even taught? You graduate and you have never heard of a strategic plan. So we can be blaming pastors, but we should be blaming the Bible school. Am I communicating? Yeah. yeah, because the work of a Bible school is to prepare people for the work they do as they, after they graduate. Are we together? Yeah. And some are even graduated in masters, but they still they have not been told about strategic planning and strategic management. So that's the first thing, and I don't even have enough time today to deal with it. And I think it was not even in our program. Yes. <laughs> so even this program, I'm sure she is listening to me. As she makes the next one. Oh, there. So you can. You now know how to prepare a strategic plan. Yes. So if I, the next time I ask you, you should be telling me you have one. Okay. That's the first problem. The second problem, even people who know, is that. Because you do not want to fail, you don't plan. And because you don't plan, you actually fail. Did you hear the, the progression? Yes. Because you see, the moment you plan, everyone will know you have failed. So you, say, so you told the church where you are going. Five years later, you are still where you, you left. Everyone says, hey, this pastor is a failure. So in order to avoid being called a failure, <laughs> 
you actually don't plan. And the real reason you don't plan is because you do not want to be called a failure. You know, they say, aim at nothing, and you're 100% sure you hate it. You get the joke? If you aim at nothing. So if you don't have a strategic plan, you're a success. Because after all, you aimed at nothing. And you actually achieved it. So that's the second problem, why people don't have strategic plans. Because they do not want to actually... Uh, actually um, know whether they, they did well or they did badly. They were like, you know, again, that's a subject I don't know whether to have dealt with, is how to assess performance. Because there are many wrong ways of assessing performance. One of the wrong ways is at the end of the year, you say, did you perform well? Surely you did. <laughs> you have that nothing and you actually you achieved, hey, you achieved it. <laughs> so, so the, a good performance management system is determined at the beginning of the year. You say what you want to achieve, how you want to achieve it, how will you measure whether you have achieved all not. And most of the plans lack that last one. How to measure. So, for example, you say we shall preach. We are intending to preach. Now, how will you know you have preached at the end of the year? If you don't have a way of measuring, you are sure you succeeded, isn't it? And then the trouble normally comes between the supervisor, the bishop, and the pastor. The people say you, are, you did not achieve. Say, how do you know? I think so. Now, even the bishop does. Because you never agreed on a measurement system at the beginning of the year, you just say, and you're there. He is seeing for me. Now, you need to understand. <laughs> you need to understand that you need a clarity on how to measure. For that. But that whole issue, that whole issue uh, can, can, be a, can be a problem in strategic man man management. The final thing, why people don't have strategic management is because it's a very expensive uh, thing in terms of time and in terms of money. You know, you don't write a plan in two days. It is it's a technical thing, requires a lot of, a lot of things you have to stop for you to do it. Now, if you are going to stop everything else, you, you souls are dying. So why don't we preach? How can you spend time preparing a plan and souls are dying? That's what we used to say in the 70s about going to Bible school. How can you go to Bible school and souls are dying? So we, used, we started preaching without any training because souls are dying. So similarly, you can, you can argue you don't have the time, you don't have the resources. It's a waste of resources. Because a good strategic plan cannot be made by somebody who attended one hour workshop or two hour workshop on how to prepare. So you are taught for two hours. Obviously, you don't qualify to write a strategic plan. <laughs> it's a whole, in a university, it's a whole semester course on strategic management. So there's no way after one course. What, what one course achieves is for you to know what you don't know. So therefore, you are able to look for somebody who can help you. Since you know what it is you want, but you know you don't have the details, you have somebody else to help you to achieve it. And some of the people are actually members of your church. Because they are the ones writing a plan for their business. They are writing a plan for their place of employment, but in church they just sit back like they know nothing. So you don't even have to be talking about getting somebody far away. You can get people who are experts and are within your church. Change management, which we are discussing, only makes sense if you know where you are going. And our discussion now is, now that you know where you are going and how it compares with where you are now, change management is, how will you manage to change from here to there. Are we together? And that whole subject in change management especially comes in what is called transformational leadership. Transformational leadership is a leadership where you are intending the place not to be the way you left, it, you found it. You expect a lot of changes within your If You are given a five-year contract, people look at it and do not even recognize 
what is there after five years. But if you are the type that want everything held constant, satellites, paribas, you know, without any changes, then ch chances are you, there will be nothing to change and there's no dis need for discussing the whole issue about change management. So I hope in that introduction, I start making you understand that it's actually lack of being a responsible leader for you not to be clear how you see the church or you see your business or you see your family in five years. So tell me, how, what is it you are expecting to have changed in five years? Most strategic plans are five year, years, but you have, that's normally called um, uh, media term. You can have a longer, a longer one. Um, so that tells you where, exactly where you'll be even after you are dead yourself. You need to be clear where you want to go. Then you have a medium one, term one that is talking about what you achieve within your contract. Then you have a short term one every year. You must have clarity on what, what you, are, you are planning. But all of them must be aligned. What you are doing in the year must help you to achieve what you are doing in five years, must help you to achieve the long term one. Are we together? So change management then is how to manage the process from where you are to where the strategic, the strategic intention is going to be. And my prayer is that if you don't hear anything else I say, that I will have caused you to want to have clarity on any business, any family that you lead on that idea of creating a, a vision. And that will be, did you say it's obeying? Ready to obey. <laughs> um, I have to be near you and tell me. <laughs> okay, so we will look at how and why change happens. Now we understand why change. Forces of organizational change, we will look at external, internal, then how to respond to change and how to manage change. And the whole process, we'll be looking at the whole, the whole process. You know, leading change is the heart of transformation of a person or a group of persons. <clears throat> leading change, really, is an issue. Transformation requires change <coughs> from an existing situation to a more desired situation that promises better life-embracing outcomes. The assumption is that you are not leading us to evil. You are not leading us to a worse place. You are leading us to something better. Change starts from within to without. <coughs> Don't start changing, wanting to change out there before you have the capacity to assimilate. Changing leaders, in, change leaders will initiate change. Change leadership decides and implements process for moving the new desired, uh, to the new desired outcome. Oh, I have to do this one. <laughs> now, I, I want, um, is, is, is this to involve People, I, I did not involve people in the middle. I went to the front and the back. Can you read what is on the wall, please? Um, in change leadership, we are encouraging African leaders to look at why change is needed, why they can lead change, and how they should lead change. That is a quote by Dr. Della Adebo, September 2011, in an interview. Leading change is at the heart of transformational leadership, Leadership is all about change. It involves move, moving a group of thoughtful, concerned citizens from an existing set of circumstances to a more desired situation. The leader must be certain that the benefits of change outweigh the costs. The increase, to increase goal ownership, the leader builds capacity by creatively educating those who will benefit from the change. <coughs> Just yes, before she goes on, have you heard you can carry out a change process that is so expensive, the benefit will be less. Don't just go to a country and see a change and come and bring it mm. home. I still, remember, I still remember going for, I told you I used to work for Shell, and I was staying for a course that must be, um, must be around 91, 1991, for a course in London. Uh, stayed there for three weeks, and we are talking about distribution and the new changes that are happening. 
I still remember going to some some place um, that's in the south of England to a refinery. That's we talked about that years ago. To a refinery, and we reached, when we reached the gate, there was no human being in the depot at all. It was just alone. So the guy with us had a card. Swipe the card, the gate just opened, and the, we participants of the course just went inside. The gate closed behind us. After some time, some tankers came. The driver passed the thing, the, it opened. He went to the loading gantry. Again, he passed the thing and connected the, connected the, the, the loading horses and just stood there. And the vehicle loaded. Then he stopped, he undid the thing, and he went back to the gate, did the car, and he left. Nobody was running that depot. It was running itself. That is that a years ago. And I said, how are you doing it? See, where he came from, the, 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 the sales counter already passed onto his card like electronically, the order. So when he does the card like this, the order will show what the machine now knows what is coming to the depot today. Because the, the customers ordered, then there was somebody who did electronically deciding this load will carry this, this, tanker will carry that, that tanker will carry that. But nobody is talking to any other, anybody else. Because mm -hmm. even the customer just placed an order. Are we together? Mm -hmm. Then, when you come, since it's already the, the computer knows what each compartment is supposed to carry. So it cannot load in compartment two more than the quantity that commander can take. So and, and then, as he is moving from there, he is driving to a petrol station that has no human beings. The petrol stations, uh, it's interesting that, that years later it has not happened in Kenya. <laughs> but there, there are no human beings in the presentation. The customer comes with a card. And you swipe your card, you fuel yourself, your own car, but the card already knows who you are. So it will, once you finish, it will tell you how much. And debit your card in your bank account. And you drive away. In the meanwhile, it has updated the depot that you, are, you, are, you now have a certain space. It will trigger an order when your stock goes low. Am I communicating? I thought that was in London. Two, three years later, I went for another course in Finland, Helsinki. And I discovered exactly the same. The depots are running themselves. And I was a young, I'm still a young man, but then I was a young visual manager. I came back to Kenya, very clear in my mind, I have no intention of implementing that idea. All my friends will be jobless. <laughs> my argument, of course, I have to argue like a businessman. We are paid so little in Kenya, there's no need of replacing us. Their labor is so expensive in Europe, no wonder they are looking for something else, isn't it? So I, I, I might, the cost of implementing it outweigh the I'm not communicating. So don't just hear that some people are doing something, and then you go and copy. Find out for me what are the benefits. And if those benefits are they worth the cost? Good changes are costly business. So we let be working. That's what you need to have. So don't go to another church and see the way they do things. And then you tell yourself, I must do it the same? Same way. What are the benefits to your church? And not just benefit in looking nice. Given your vision and objective, is that particular change going to help you to achieve your vision and objective? That's really what we are talking about. And that's a very, very, that's why I talk there because it's a very, very important thing. Don't change should not be just for the sake of time. Becoming back to that, the last point. How do organizations experience sustainable change? Organizational research has found that there are generally eight stages for the process of leading change. And we'll be looking at all the, the eight processes.
This, this one is for going back. Oh, so, so. How come it's not all right? Yes. Okay, those are the eight steps. You know, the first thing you want to change, after you have written a strategic plan, you create a sense of urgency. Because even if you can see where you want to go, you wonder, why can't my son Solomon achieve it? Assuming you are David. You know that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, so it is true we need a tempo, but not during your time, David. So you must not change your happen. Given its cost, it will not happen until your team believes it's not only a good change, but it required agency. And that's the first step. Second step, you must look a few people who agree with you. Don't try to convince everybody. <laughs> so you must build a guiding coalition. People who are early adapters who can easily agree with you. Meet them, agree with them. By the time you start rolling to others, you already have a team of like-minded people. Then, with that team, one, after one and two, you have now got a team to clarify what your vision is and get the vision right. Let everybody in the collection team agree exactly how does the end look like. Number four, communicate vision for buying. After now one to three is only when you start talking to everybody else. Telling the whole church where you intend to go. Why you intend to go it. Go, go there. Until, and don't start until, not that you have told them, but you get a buy-in. What's a buy-in I told you? When they stop calling it the pastor's project, they start calling it oh. project. That's now they have a, a buy-in. Only then, remember all oh, one to four, you have done nothing yet. Is number five, clear roadblocks and empower action. You look at all the barriers will stop you achieving. And then empower action. And you, you, you create short term wins. If you tell them what they will get in that years, you must also check what can we win early. Because the quick wins are the ones that will give the energy for the long term wins. And then number seven means you keep at it. Don't give up until you make the change accurate stick. Now, last time I asked two, two people if you can be three to be okay. Can, um, I, can I ask a question? Go right ahead. <clears throat> two questions. One, thank you for the steps. Um, are they necessarily systematic? Uh, can they overlap? Can you hold that question until I go through the details? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because we, this is the main topic we are going to deal with. Okay. I will not know to use it okay. so that you can do the exercise. Okay. And then you will come back and we go through the whole thing again. Thank you. So, you can be three of you, can be two of you. The choice is yours. Give a story of a change you led in your organization, church, or family. Because we, are, we want to, if, if I talk alone, I have already given you some, some ideas. But you want to hear from more facilitators. Because I'm not the only one who knows. So I know you have a story. We can't all share. We don't have enough time to share with your neighbor. Are we together? Yes. They can be two or three. Yes. Agree, with, agree with them. Um, agree with them. But let me go to the... the you either do that one. You don't have enough time. I'm giving you seven minutes. So you either do number one or number two. Number two says, give story of change projects you have been involved in. You know the first one? You are the leader. Are we together? If, the, if you choose the first one, you must talk about a change you led yourself. If you choose the second one, you are just involved. And what, what was the change meant to achieve? Give the before and after the picture. See something that has happened. This is the way we were. This is where we are afterwards. These are the benefits. Then you ask yourself, list the steps that were followed to, the after, to be at the after level. And what were the challenge 
the challenges and how are they overcome? What was the particular what was your particular role since you are not the leader? What role did you play? What character and competence do you feel a good change leader needs? Because of that experience, if somebody is going to lead change, he should have this competence. Tell us what it is. Is the assignment clear? Yes. I do not say is it easy. I just say is this clear. <laughs> so share with your neighbor.